Hello everybody, Zach Couples, physical therapist here, and folks, I'm here to save you time because I've put out a lot of content this year, a lot of stuff on all things biomechanics, and you're probably wondering, Zach, I know they weren't all the bomb.com, and I get it, they probably weren't, but there were some that were better than others, and folks, if you want to learn some really in-depth biomechanics regarding the pelvis, regarding the foot, regarding all types of stuff, then you want to tune in because I'm going to share with you the top 10 posts slash videos of 2021. Links to all of them are going to be in the description below as well as the full post. So let's uh, dive in, give it a shot, see what we got. Number 10, all about the pelvic floor. I had a bit of an epiphany this year, and I'll admit I screwed up. I spent some time learning from my mentor, Bill Hartman, about the pelvic floor dynamics, and clarifying this really helped me out in terms of understanding the biomechanics and movement dynamics of the pelvic floor and how it relates to movements and, and pressure changes within the sacrum. So in this post, I outline the biomechanics of the pelvic floor, how that changes in regards to different movements that we might utilize in the gym and why in the heck this area of the body is so dang important. Give it a shot. Number nine, split squat biomechanics. The split squat is an incredibly versatile move, but folks, it ain't so versatile if you don't know what the heck is going on at each portion of the split squat. Folks, that's about to change because I go in deep in split squat mechanics, how the ranges of motion and rotations change throughout this wonderful move and how you can use that knowledge to improve your selection of how you want the split squat to occur. Because sometimes folks, you might keep someone at a higher depth in their split squat. Sometimes you might wanna go all the way down. Sometimes you might hold a weight a certain way. Sometimes you might hinge them. How do you know when to do all that? Well, you'll know by checking out this post. Number eight, maxillary expansion before and after one year in the Crozat appliance. This actually was my most controversial post that I have written in a hot minute. And I learned a lot from it. And basically what I learned is there's three things you can't talk about with people, and that's religion, politics, and whatever upper airway treatment that you are doing. And the reason why is because there's some controversy surrounding whether you should utilize a tooth bone or a bone born bone born appliance and what the effects are on breathing, sleep, among other things. In this post, I outline my side of things. So I underwent utilizing a Crozet appliance, which basically pushes the teeth out to make more room for the tongue. You make more room for the tongue, in theory, that will open up the airway a bit more, so it makes it easier to breathe. Did that happen? Well, you gotta check out the post to learn more. But I go into my entire experience over the first year of having this before. Your boy had these braces. What changes happened, what didn't happen? You might find it useful. I would definitely check it out. Number seven, core training. Do rib flares matter? Why is the stack and a posterior tilt really useful? Core stuff, like how does this area of my body work? Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you in this post right here, folks, because those are some of the things that we outline. We look at misconceptions surrounding things like rib flare. How can we best recruit them phenomenal abdominals to enhance your movement capabilities? Your boy Big Z will give you the answers in this post. Number six, hip flexors don't work. Try these two exercises instead. Everybody loves to stretch their hip flexors, don't they? It's like, oh man, they're so tight all the time. But here's the problem, folks. Most of those hip flexor stretches don't work. And the reason why is because the way you are doing them do not stretch or create a release in your hip flexors that well. In this post, I outline mechanics and ways to improve your hip mobility in a manner so that your hip flexors are less tight. So that way you're moving and grooving like a rock star. I hope that you like it. Go ahead and check it out. Number five, lateral pelvic tilt. Learn it all. Sure, anterior tilt, posterior tilt, hips translating forward, all that gets love. But folks, what if you got a little dip in your hip like that? What do you do about that? Why does that happen? 
Well, the answers to that will be found in this post, Lateral Pelvic Tilt, Learn It All. Here we outline the biomechanics as to why someone would have a lateral tilt. Hint, it's a compensatory strategy to pick up internal rotation why you might have it on one side versus the other, and most importantly, what the heck to do about it. And there are some very simple, effective exercise strategies that you can employ to enhance your movement capabilities in this area, get you moving better, and not be so tilted. Number four, limited shoulder motion. Where should I start? Well, you should start by checking out this post because, folks, I think that improving mobility of the shoulder ought to occur in a sequential fashion. And the reason why it should occur in a sequential fashion is because certain ranges that you move with your arm correspond to filling certain parts of the rib cage. For example, T2 to T4 has more of the horizontal fibers of some of your cuff muscles. So it may be that certain measures might become limited if I can't create effective expansion in that upper part of the thorax. So how do I know what measurement corresponds to what area of the thorax? You'll know by checking out this post. We go in deep in it. It uh, still reigns pretty much true to this day in terms of the way I look at different testing and how I choose interventions to help people move better. I think you'll really like it. Number three, improving hip and shoulder internal rotation without stretching. Folks, it can be easy peasy lemon squeezy to understand the didactic and the biomechanics and really nerd out. But where I think most things on the internet lack is practical application. Not only that, but seeing it live. A lot of us don't show our work. I wanted to show my work to this time. So what I did was I took my wonderful nephew, B, and he's never done any of the, the stuff that I do, none of this breathing stuff or anything like that. And I performed an assessment on him and I treated him live. And I even failed in this. There was an exercise I chose that did not work whatsoever. So I thought it was a really good way to just illustrate how dynamic this process is when trying to improve someone's movement capabilities. And I think you will find it useful. In fact, it was one of the most viewed videos that I had had put out this year. So you'll definitely want to check this out and I hope you learn a lot from it. Number two, five mistakes that I've made as a physical therapist. Folks, in the days of the internet and social media, everyone shows their best life and their successes and everything else that's going well. But here's the problem. You don't learn a whole lot from your successes. You learn some, of course, but nowhere near as much as you would learn from your failures. And folks, I've made a few failures in my day. In fact, I've made at least five because that's what we talk about in this post. I outlined some five of the biggest failures that I've had as a clinician and what I've learned from it. And that's one of the crux of mentorship is you want me to screw up and then I'm going to save you time so that way you don't have to make those same mistakes. And by learning about ways that I failed as a clinician and how to do better, it's only going to make you a better clinician, coach, or whatever else you are doing with your life. And the number one post for 2021 is foot compensation patterns. We got a lot of people liking feet up in the fam and I get it because there's a lot of wild and crazy things that can go on with the foot and the interaction of the foot on the ground can potentially be a limiting step to your ability to improve someone's movement capabilities in the rest of their body. But Zach, I don't know what the foot's going on. So where do I even start? What are some compensatory strategies that I might see at my feet? Well, you'll get the answer to that in this post. Here we outline some of the common compensations that I see, which one of the biggest is a loss of calcaneal eversion. And we go over how to treat these compensatory activities so you can enhance your movement capabilities, help your peeps move better and feel like rock stars. There's a reason why this post was number one and because it's got a gold mine of information with all things foot. And really this year, it's been one of the areas that I focused on a lot more with my treatment and it's led to a lot greater outcomes for my Supreme clientele. And folks, there are the top 10 posts of 2021 to rein in the new year. I hope to bring you a lot more wonderful posts, videos, and everything else that you need so 
you can move better so you can help your supreme clientele move better and we'll keep on learning which post was your favorite is there a video that you absolutely liked that wasn't on the list go ahead and comment below and let the fam know so we can uh, see what else out there was pretty good on the internet if you like this video please hit the like subscribe button or uh, you know leave a review whatever you gotta do to help the fam keep growing thank you all for an amazing 2021 i know it's been a uh, an interesting couple years that we've been dealing with, but I'm going to still keep pushing because uh, you all inspire me and I appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you so much for tuning in. You've been an incredible, outstanding audience and I hope that you keep it real but not to the extent things go wrong. Stay hungry, stay learning, stay moving, and I'll see you next year. Deuces.